That's unusual that someone's slightly taller than I am. <laughs> Welcome everyone, I'm Diana Ingram. I'm the Executive Director at Hill Center at the Old Naval Hospital. And I see a lot of familiar faces, but I'm wondering is there anyone who's never been here before? Oh, hooray, welcome, welcome, come back. Uh, please take a look at, at your programs. There's a wonderful biography of our esteemed poet, but also heads up on fabulous things coming down the pike at Hill Center. And I'll call your attention to a community survey that we are taking, and the link is, you can QR code it, or you know, just take it to your computer, but please, we'd really like to hear from you, and, you know, get your thoughts, particularly the new folks who've never been here before. Uh, please take a moment to turn off your mobile devices and phones. Uh, it is a great honor to welcome Katie Didden, and uh, welcome her back, actually. Ten, it was 10 years ago, it was 2013. Um, and she's just been doing fabulous things, which you can read about in, in the program. But really exciting to, to have her talk about her new book of poetry, Or Choir, The Lava on Iceland. And I was going to have a copy of the book to hold up, but I forgot that. It is available for sale right outside, and directly after her presentation, Katie is going to sign copies so, of not only that book, but I think East City Books also has several other copies of your work, so that, that's super exciting. All right, welcome to everyone, welcome to Katie Benham and her family. This is a very special moment for Hill Center. We're sitting in the Abraham Lincoln Hall, which was underwritten by National Capital Bank many years ago during the original or most recent renovation of the building in honor of George Ditton, her father. So it's particularly appropriate to, to welcome you to, to share your latest creative extravaganza. everyone, thanks for being here, and thanks to Diane for that introduction. Um, I also want to thank Marianne Brownlow for all of your work organizing this event, uh, and I'm grateful for all the ways that you've made us feel welcome here today, I really appreciate it. It takes a lot uh, to plan an event, an event like this, and I, I know that, so thank you. And thanks also to eCity Books for being here, for making the book available for purchase, that's very exciting along with independent bookstores. Um, thanks also to my sister, Amanda, for connecting us, for making this possible, and to my mom and my whole family for your support. And thanks all of you for being here. So today I'm gonna give a book talk and describe for you the process of creating my newest book, or choir, The Lava on Iceland. And I'm gonna set up the book description and then I'll read some poems. So I'm a poet and I'm fascinated by geology. My story is a good example of what a liberal arts education can do. And I have some dear friends from college here uh, from WashU to testify to this. So when I was an undergrad, I took geology classes to fulfill my science requirements. At the same time, I was taking my first poetry workshops. And those subjects somehow fused in my mind. Thinking about lava activates my imagination. And I share this in common with many artists, uh, including Diane Burko, whom I met recently, and who offered to let me show some images for this talk. And uh, Diane has a new exhibit, Disordered Systems, opening. It opened two days ago at Towson, at the uh, Towson University's Art Museum. So I recommend checking that out. Um, but for now, I just wanted to show these images to kind of set the stage for our imagining today. Welcome. Hello. 
So I also love to hike, and many of my poems began on trips to the North Cascades, Death Valley, and Patagonia. My love for the environment is intuitive. I'm not the kind of person who knows the Latin names of trees, or who can identify birds by their song, as many of you know my father could do that very easily. Um, and I can't explain to you in scientific terms what causes eruptions or tectonic collisions or global warming, though I'm doing my best to learn those things. I'm also not a philosopher or a theologian ready to debate whether features of the environment, not just trees and birds, but even rocks and ice, are sentient. But I am a poet. Like Emily Dickinson, I dwell in possibility. As a writer, I make sense of experience by shaping it into patterns of form, and especially patterns of rhythm. My ideas take shape in words. My trade is association. One thing is like another. The boundaries blur so that the brain can be a cedar chamber, its roof a sky. And so I can spread my hands wide to gather paradise. If the truth I'm after is emotion, the test of that truth is music. Yeats taught us crickets sing. Harjo hears the trees speaking. Maybe like me, you felt the low hum of a wasp whir through your body before you heard it in your ear. I started to write poems in the voices of creatures and features of the natural world because of a wasp that would visit my studio and hover lethargically like a ghost. When it died, my neighbor, who knew the wasp was a muse, placed it on an index card on which she'd written, R.I.P. Raphael, and gave it to me. I put it on my desk and I studied how it looked. It looked human and not at all human at the same time. Two eyes, segmented body, folded wings, one antenna raised high like a final insight. What got me was the way its legs were folded neatly over its body, like how we fold the hands of our dead. It looked holy. Because the wasp was named Raphael, I wrote about archangels and Renaissance painters. As I chose a form for the poems, I felt that the wasp would speak in short lines, short bursts of rhythm, surrounded by a lot of space. The form that I found was tiny tercets cinched in the middle, like the body of a wasp. When I thought about what it would mean to see Caravaggio's painting, The Taking of Christ, through the eyes of a literal wasp, I noticed different things than I would have seen otherwise. It gave me a new angle of perception on both the painting and the gospel story. After that, I wanted to know what the wasp thought about many things, from weddings to Kierkegaard. The wasp became a generalist I like to consult from time to time. In my life, writing these poems changed my relationship to wasps. My fear mixes with a wider feeling of connection and curiosity. It's not that I believe that wasps are human, but writing those poems helped me to consider their agency. As the poet Alexis Pauline Gums said in an interview with Adrienne Marie Brown, when she writes in the voice of a manatee, it's not to make the manatee more human, it's to actually try to dissolve the idea of what human is. Because that idea is blocking the communion and right relationship that we have to create. So I'll read for you one of the wasp poems. The Wasp on Renaissance Painters. Imagine the Virgin imagining figs. Paint a Mary who stares at a plate of sliced figs. Imagine the cherubs imagining figs. Imagine green, cappuccino yellow. Imagine mercurial vermilion in the black background of a body. See my oiled wing as the armor of Romans who grip in the post-kiss of Judas, the luminous cursor of figs. 
Speaking in the voices of non-human creatures and things is not a new idea. The first poet that comes to mind for me is Ovid. In the Metamorphoses, he describes hybrid creatures like the god Pan, who's part human-shaped, part goat, or like centaurs, half-horses, half-humans. In so many stories, Ovid writes of humans who transform, like Daphne, who turns into a laurel tree to escape Apollo. The tree is both laurel and Daphne. In my first book, after I wrote about the wasp, I also wanted to write in the voice of a glacier and the voice of a sycamore. I made the wasp into a formula. First, I assigned each of those characters a secret secondary persona. I modeled the glacier on Perito Moreno in Patagonia. When I went there, I was struck by how many people were taking pictures. And at the time, people were still using flash cameras, so it looked like the glacier was hounded by paparazzi. <laughs> so the glacier in my mind was a former, also a former Hollywood starlet, aging because the glacier was crumbling before our eyes. So here are two of the glacier poems. The Glacier on Middle Age. The threat of death breathes its heat on your neck, softens your features, finally teaches your youth to you. The inner light that shone in your face is snuffed by a rough powder, by boot scuffs. Yet compression gives an age obscuring gleam, a startling blue. Your beauty is now up to you. The Glacier on Lack of Sleep. When day comes, the light's too bright. A yawn forms behind the spires of your eyes. Your jaw cracks, splits a crevasse. Little parts of you collapse. If you were older or cared less about being seen, you would lie down in public. After my first book was published, I wanted to continue working in this method, and I wanted to write in the voice of lava. When I thought of lava's secret secondary persona, to me it was something preoccupied with forms and with creation and destruction. So the lava to me is an artist. When I was trying to think of the form I would use to access the voice of lava, erasure came to mind. And this is a poetic process when poets take a block of prose, then ink over some of the words and letters, leaving a lyric poem in relief. So I'm going to give you some examples of contemporary poets who've used the form. And probably the most famous is Tom Phillips, and he has a book called A Humument, and he uh, erased the same 19th century novel again and again. He actually just recently passed away, but he has dozens of um, techniques like this where he goes into the page, pulls out letters, and creates um, a drawing or a painting. So, um, let's see, that's, this, I, you know, this is Sonia Johansson, Ovad, and so using uh, rose petals to obscure the text. Jen Bourbon uses blue thread uh, as a way of creating that same effect. Uh, Yael Masson, Cycles in the Night, this is using ink. And another person who's quite famous for this is Mary Rufel, who uses white out, and her book's called A Little White Shadow. So you can see, this is just, so many poets are using this technique. Almost every poet I know has tried this. <laughs> Kathleen, I'm looking at you. Um, but I just find it such a, an engaging form. It's this really fun way of working. Uh, and despite its ubiquity, it's a complicated, and it's actually often a controversial form. And I've written a lot of essays trying to come to terms with that. Um, ultimately, I believe that this form, erasure, is uniquely responsive to our current relationship with the environment. It registers our eco-conscious anxieties because it emphasizes the instability of both language and of place, particularly when the subject is the history of land. So um, 
I find the eco-poetic possibilities to be true, especially in the cases where uh, poets preserve the original source text, and then it becomes more an exposure than an erasure. So I believe it exposes the polyvocality already inherent in the poetic process. Uh, so it seemed to me that ink flowing over paper was similar to the process of lava flowing over the land. And the poem that emerges is the new topography. And it was lava that led me to Iceland, one of the only places you can walk beside a divergent plate boundary. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge runs through Iceland, separating the North American and Eurasian plates. So for this project, I started with all kinds of source texts about Iceland, from interviews with Bjork and the first female president of Iceland, to the journals of William Morris, to histories, to articles about Game of Thrones, to Icelandic water bottle labels, to Siggy's yogurt labels. Um, so I'm going to read the title poem from the collection. And I found the poem by studying the primary text, which was an interview with Bjork by Matthias Augustiniak and Michael Amzalai for Interview Magazine. So here's the first line of prose. And then, of course, there's the recording we did in the church in Iceland, which was very spontaneous. And I'm just going to demonstrate how this goes. So the poem is, Ocean erased, I didn't feel real. I wanted iron songs, ample time, a sphere concert, an oar choir, the core's sly music. So you'll see I have a demo here. I started with the text like this of prose, and you'll see I'm pulling out in red um, the lyric poem from inside of that. Really advanced PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see I pulled a poem out of the prose there. The process is kind of mystical. The voice I find is eerily consistent, and I don't think it's exactly like my poetic voice or my non erasure voice. So to me, it's kind of dragon like, it has, it's kind of an oracle, it has a booming quality. And while we think of wasps and trees, all of those as having lifespans, and we see them grow and move, we often think of stone and earth as inert. Um, and I was surprised to discover that the voice of lava is plural. Um, and it's also, uh, it's not merely a gimmick that it's plural. So in a recent interview with Bjork for Art Forum, Robin Wall Kimmerer points to their common perception of land. And this is Robin Wall Kimmerer speaking. She says, And I love the way that language reminds us of that animacy of the living world. And that those rocks that you speak of are living beings. You know, with their own stories, their own history, their own gifts to the world. And that's something that's so precious to me about the Potawatomi language, is that everything is a verb. It isn't just a state of matter. It has agency, right? You know, it could create itself again. It could be something else. What Kimmerer and Bjork discuss makes sense to me. In these poems, I harmonize with the source text, but the source texts are working in concert with each other too. These poems are also collaborative. One of my dearest friends, Kevin Sun, figured out how to make these poems look like lava. And we were sitting at this table, and I uh, you know, was trying to figure out how to create the look, and I had all these orange paint pens. And I started just moving over uh, the text, and I was so proud of it, and I showed it to him. And he's, of course, a graphic designer. And the easiest way to get your graphic designer friends to help you is to try it yourself. <laughs> And they'll be so uh, frustrated that they'll just uh, not be able to resist showing you a better way to go. And little did he know that um, we'd be working on it together for 10 years after he figured out this uh, process. So there's Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Okay. So this is what I would send to Kevin, is I'd send the uh, 
prose passage, inked out this way, and then he would set it. So this is his, his demo. He would, he called those finding the continents. He would go in and find the continents. And then uh, we invited friends who were traveling to Iceland uh, and fellow you know, artists and writers. We kept hearing of all these people who were going to Iceland and we would say, send us a photo. And so the book has kind of a sub-narrative. It's why are all these artists drawn to Iceland? Uh, and this is actually one of Kevin's photos. So he, he takes the photo, he puts it behind the image, then he goes in and does this very intricate work with the grayscale, where it's not just one level of grayscale, he's got several levels going on there. So, Okay, so um, I'm going to read some poems now, after all of that set up. And what I'm going to do is read the first line from the prose passage, and then read the poem. So you'll get a flavor of the prose. This, uh, this first one, the photo is by the architect Jennifer Lung, and the primary text is by Gudmundur Half Danerson, the Historical Dictionary of Iceland. And this is the first line. Althingi. The Parliament of Iceland, Althingi, is a central institution in Icelandic history and public life. It traces its history back to the beginning of the Commonwealth period. And here's the poem, and this is the lava speaking. Art is central, sun and stone. I trace the beginning of the modern. I paint veils. The old fear arises that the public won't care, that the sea is the true genius. I change when I meet air sending embers arcing in syncopating showers. I still blanch at the void. The answer is, again and again, to erase the ground. My dearest friends are drawn to the same fire. This next poem, the photo is by the poet Diana Coy Gwen, and the primary text is William Morris, and it's from his journals uh, when he traveled to Iceland. And here's the first line. Meantime, we got off our horses and sat down in a pretty grassy hollow, and the Icelanders brought out champagne and glasses to drink from the stirrup cup. And here's the lava. Meteors petrify me. Dead matter vanished into the scantiest of tracks. A white flare, eerily anonymous. I'm Earth's aorta. I thrum against erosion. O oh, spur of the alien cosmos, slinging nerves with feral nickels, fall back into a flat curve just above our resting place. Be no harbinger. Usher us godwards on the pulse of our surprise. Okay, this next one, uh, the photos by Kevin, and the primary text is by Isabel Berwick, and it's beyond the wall in Iceland's Game of Thrones. So she went on a Game of Thrones tour and wrote this article. So the first line, after visiting the extraordinary lava stacks at Dimmu Borgir, used to film scenes of wildling leader Mans Raiders camp, we drive to lunch on a working farm near the lake. Sing lava, a dimmu burger lay, a lunar acre, a panoramic tremor. Wanderers favor angels, bards, obsidian, rock of old. The lava is the dragon. I clot the sky with gold. Okay, so uh, Kevin is a vegan, and when we were in Iceland, we went uh, and tried all the vegan restaurants. They have a lot of really good ones there in Reykjavik. So this is uh, the woman who ran one of our favorite restaurants. Her name is uh, Solveig Eriksdottir, 
So this is uh, Kevin's photo. The primary source is Solvig Eric's daughter called Vegan in Iceland. And the first line. Wild thyme and caraway seeds are our special spices. Both grow wild, and Icelandic people have their favorite spots to pick them. So I was researching for this one, I was researching lichen, and I was researching the symbiotic relationship between um, uh, the fungi and the algae, and it seemed to me like a Romeo and Juliet. So this is, this is for, the Folger, for the Folger folks here. Okay. Oh, soft, wet sun through fungal cells shines green. It is the algae, miles from sea. Lichen, sweetening, stone to soil, a reverie. It grows all over as four gemmed lines everyone loves. This photo is by Paige Critcher. And the um, primary source is Vanita Salisbury. What exactly is volcano bread? So this is a recipe for volcano bread. And in Iceland, uh, uh, what the article speaks about is that um, there's a family that would put all the ingredients for a loaf of bread in a big tin and wrap the tin and then bury it uh, in the geothermal heat overnight and it cooks and rises overnight in the tin. So um, this erasure, the reason it's so thin is because it's a recipe. Um, here's the poem. Inside time, the future rises, a loaf fit for its tin. But while I dream, rogue steam outs the now in then, and the hours spin. I'm just going to read a few more. This one is uh, the photos by Britt Hultgren, and the primary text is Paul Walker and Jonathan Hunt, The Legacy of Reykjavik and the Future of Nuclear Disarmament, and this is from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. First line. What then is Reykjavik's legacy? Gorbachev warned Reagan at Reykjavik that their window of opportunity was narrow. Time passed, things changed, the Soviet leader said. If they failed to agree, Reykjavik would be simply a memory. And I wanted to know what the lava thought about that. This is the lava. Words start war, then war is wordless. Mistranslated missive, a missile begins as emotion. A sense the animal, enemy is animal, like you. All life, brief as disaster, echoes the bang, and human code coils around a single fuse. At the frayed ends, world leaders ink out the legacy of manias. Just a few more. Um, at the heart of this book are three double erasures where a priest, a scientist, and the vulva of Norse mythology interview the lava about the 1783 Lakageiger eruption. This was a massive eruption that lasted for eight months, and it lowered global temperatures, and it had devastating consequences in Iceland and around the world. So they also, they think it was one of the original causes of the French Revolution, for example. Um, and it froze the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and people didn't know what had caused it. One of the people who speculated was Ben Franklin, and he actually guessed it was a volcano in Iceland. But of course, communications weren't uh, as developed back then, so people really didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> so for these poems, I moved through the source text twice, and I moved through once for the interviewer to find questions, and as far as I get to find the question, I move through it a second time to find the answer, the lava's reply. Okay. Um, so even though these situations are vastly different, studying the history of the Lockheed eruption gave me a way to think about our current climate crisis. Then as now, changes in climate affected every aspect of civilization from biological survival to politics, religion, and art. 
Then as now people work to facilitate human migration and the global distribution of resources. And somehow imagining Lava's perspective provided a kind of eerie consolation. And I've had this on my mind as I've been listening to the news after the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, and how <clears throat> the ongoing conflicts are creating you know, catastrophic obstacles for rescuers there. And meditating on massive tectonic forces really puts things into perspective. You know, who are we as humans? How, how can we help each other, our shared humanity? So to close, I'm going to read two of these poems. And then I have one bonus poem. Uh, the first one is, the vulva is a, a, a prophetess. She questions the lava. So um, the source text is by Gordon Jacoby, Karen Workman, and Roseanne DeRigo, and is titled, the Lockheed Eruption of 1783, Tree Rings, and Disaster for the Northwest Alaska Inuit. So essentially they did an interdisciplinary study where they um, cross-referenced tree ring data in, in Alaska with oral histories to figure out whether it was this eruption that had had such an impact on the, um, the Kaurak uh, people. If you know the Balasvab poem, you'll also hear that I'm essentially translating it. You're familiar with it. Okay. So here's the first line. Information about a severely cold summer comes from a book recording the oral traditions of the Kaurak people from Northwest Alaska. So this is in two voices, so I'm just going to go size. <laughs> Vulva. Nine ages I read, tracing tree rings. When no light shone in the yawning gap, what were you? Lava. Matter begins as bodies moving. To see me, unscrew one eye to the socket and stash it in a well. Let salt unseal a story. And in the ill ages of ash, like a hound traversing earth, what did you seek? The orb spins, villages rise again. Uncivil river, death hewn, a floor song. Listen. Songs of starvation and death survive, ear to ear. I eye the ridgeline, rivering the softest rock to know more. Far back in time, the cloven heavens seared into us a century of wailing. Know ye more or not? Pattern sounder, Silmaril, by tree light the world's in mourning. A stone knowledge gleams at the letting go. I unmake eternity, rewild gold, fluent as the migratory birds that reverse the ground. Describe being all exposed and here now. Walls fall in a wolf age, leakless the fields, there slain gods adorn the trees. Runes graved on bone draw sap, the frozen veins flash, say it, words last, poet, listen. Okay, so uh, the, the next one is the scientist questioning the lava and the uh, photos by Kevin. You, this is our cover photo. And the primary source is Thorvaldur Thordersen and Stephen Self. And they did a, um, an in-depth study of the atmospheric and environmental effects of the eruption. So the first line of prose. In the first week, the lucky plumes brought sulfuric haze, ashfall, and acid rain. So again, it's two voices. So here's the scientist. Define deep time. Fishers in the pasture. List skies. A rain of blobs and brine. Measure the ruin of days. A red sun shorn of its rays. The opposite of Lockie is the past, the past. What was fixed? What was fluid? Lobes crept in hollows, birds fled. 
Can we read this pattern as prediction? Feel the scale? Hairs whistle, rivers dwindle, horses wail. Index the scene, smoke, blue and reaching. Reenact the flows, no one alive knows. What lingers, danger. Draw the figure, fire. So I'm going to read one more poem. This is a very, you know, experimental book. <laughs> As you can tell, maybe there's a lot of explanation there, but I'm going to read, I'm working on a, a third collection that goes back to more narrative poems that I had in my first book. And this one, um, I want to dedicate to my nieces. And I've asked Georgia if it's okay if I read it. Um, and this is when, during uh, the pandemic, for a short while, we would meet on Thursdays and uh, have some kind of Zoom afternoon creative time together. And this is called uh, Meeting My Nieces on Zoom to Watch Animal Live Cams. <laughs> At, oh, I have actually a, I have a photo for you. Oh. <laughs> At first, all that moved was the Chesapeake Bay itself and a strip of blue plastic that whipped like a flag in the middle of the nest. So I clicked on grizzly fishing in the Kenai instead. So many salmon leaping, we were surprised how long it took the bear to catch one, but it did turning away from the falls to pull the fish apart in long strips like a fruit, which Georgia found not gross, but interesting. <laughs> and when we clicked back to the bay, the osprey was there on its nest, turning its head into the wind, looking all around. We wondered what it was waiting for, whether it saw the camera, how it was we knew it was uneasy. And Mary Kate wondered how old it was. Was it the baby or the parent? And Georgia said, this osprey is old, I can tell by its eyes. And when we saw its crown of feathers, its pale feet, Mary Kate said it was a ghost, and I asked why, and all of us agreed it was because it looked a little mean. My nieces zoomed from separate forts in their basement, their blanket caved so dark, they looked like ghosts themselves in the blue light. When we watched jellyfish, Mary Kate wondered if they dreamed of land, and Georgia wondered in what sense they might hear without ears. And Mary Kate said they look like a coral reef. And Georgia said they look like skirts with no bodies in them. <laughs> and I said they look like eyes with long lashes. And Mary Kate connected the dots to extend that thought, creating a future of conversations to live for. And then my niece's voices started breaking up. The connection lagged. I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but we stayed on anyway for a long time, each of us studying the other's moves for signs and listening slantwise to the sounds we made, trying our best to make sense to each other for as long as possible. Thank you. so I have to abandon it. And that has happened, especially in the beginning. There's this one book I really wanted to work with, uh, Eileen Miles, The Importance of Being Iceland. And I tried a few of pages, and I, I don't know what it was. I couldn't crack it. So yes, sometimes I had to abandon it. As I got better at it, that happened less often. So, yeah. Yes, yep. Uh, I just wondered what drew you to Bjorg. So, you know, I mean, she's so beautiful in, in that photograph, but, what, you know, was there some particular connection? Gosh, to Bjork. Um, I've always just been a fan of her music. So, uh, when I was thinking about source text, that's one of the first places I went. And in fact, working, I have three, only two, one appears in the book, but I interviewed three different passages 
interviews with Bjork. Interviews work really well for this process for some reason, because I'm trying to create a voice. Because those are so um, vocalized, the quality of the language was really terrific from interviews. And she is also so imaginative, so um, her responses, even though it was prose, was, were incredibly poetic. So it just uh, gave a lot to work with. Um, and I, I think, if, you know, if you think about, like, she has a new album out, and it's very spoken. It's almost like, it is sung, but it's, it's almost like spoken word in some places. And uh, so there might be some of that inflection in the poem itself. Um, yeah, I've always just been a fan of her music. Katie? That's a great question. I um, worked on this book, and I, I was working on another book at the same time. The what will be my third book, the more narrative book. And I liked I liked going back and forth a lot um, because the erasures are so uh, constrained. But in some ways, that's a freedom because I don't have to make any decisions, um, and so it's almost like solving a Sudoku puzzle, um, and it. So there's a pleasure, it's very absorbing. Both of them are absorbing, but the, the erasures are even more absorbing because it's kind of trying to, um, yeah, kind of find your way through this maze. Um, so I don't know that I like one uh, more than the other, but I will say that, you know, presenting this book requires a lot of explanation. <laughs> and I'm kind of looking forward to a book where all I have to do is show up and and hold my book and read you some poems, so. <laughs> um, yes, Georgia. Repeat the question. I will. So Georgia asks, how do you figure out the character for the lava? Um, and initially I was thinking about the secret persona. I thought, you know, what if lava had a human profession, what it would be? And I thought about an artist because an artist is someone preoccupied with forms and is somebody who's working with materials and uh, is not afraid really to destroy something in order to make something new. So that's why I picked that. Yeah. Hello, hi Bergie. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Um, how, did you, how did you deal with revision in your erasure? Because once you like it, you kind of have to decide that's it, because otherwise, you know, you cut a lot, or you start all over again? Or... Yeah, that's a great question. How do you deal with revision? Um, so, I do revise them, but not to the same extent as other poems, because I feel like when you solve it, um, you've already done a lot of, think so much thinking to get to that little spot, but I, did revi I do revise them sometimes, but it's like, um, I was telling someone, it's like, uh, mopping the kitchen floor and then you end up in the middle. <laughs> and you're like, how do I get out of here? Uh, and there's a couple of them in there where it feels, I felt like I had nowhere to go and then suddenly something broke through and it was very exciting. Or, or you know, going back after a while and seeing, you know, each time you go in it would show you something different. So I don't revise these to the same extent as others, but, um, but it can be done and there are several of them where yeah, you just go back in there, and then it is, you, I, I, I guess, you know, I have pages where you can see the, um, I started in pencil, and, uh, yeah, I think if you saw those, you'd see that there's all these different directions that happen, um, but, it's, yeah, it's kind of like writing a sonnet, though, where the form is so tight that um, you're doing a lot of the work in advance, so. So I'm very interested because lava is very organic and it's hot, and uh, then it dries up and it gets petrified. So from your process, are you more inspired while it's moving and while it's hot and while there is heat, or after it dies and becomes petrified forever? Wow, that's a great question. I think I was hoping to channel 
the heat as I was working, so the process of moving through the prose felt like moving, like you're, you're trying to find, you're pushing against the old rock and trying to find a way forward. Um, but I'm interested in how it relates to deep time or history, so... Um, uh, that's an interesting question, whether... I think it, I just went be between them. But in the process itself, I was thinking more of, of it being fluid. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. That'd be interesting to look back. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy, hi. I'm not sure quite how to voice this, but um, I'm trying to superimpose what you're saying about the length of time that this project took. And what I know of your biography. <laughs> Also a great question. I think um, I think I just kept coming back to it, and uh, I think initially, I, if, you know, for poets, we think in terms of books, we think in terms of certain page numbers, and a chapbook would be fifteen pages, and a you know a full length would be forty-eight pages. So I think I probably got to fifteen pages and didn't feel like I had finished and that I wanted to keep going. Um, and I'm not sure when that occurred uh, in the process of it, but you know, I, I probably would do a five of them per summer. So, um, uh, and again, it was kind of like a relief from the other kinds of poems I was writing. So, uh, and then I think it was then I, when I decided I wanted to go there, and that was in 2016. Uh, and you know, I wrote a grant to be able to go and spend time there. So that's probably the time when it became serious. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's probably. But it's very intuitive. I don't even know if I had this like, okay, now is the time where this is. I'm committed to this. It was more just small decisions along the way. So yeah. Yes. Hi. How do you pick the text you're going to work on? Because that has a huge influence on what you end up with. Because it takes the words that are in the text. So do you have criteria or some way? Because there's thousands of texts you could consider, but you have to select a few that you're actually going to take poems about. Yeah, that's a great question. And, it, and I just let myself um, be like a pinball. And whenever somebody would mention something, I would, you know, I would move towards that, and I would uh, find something there. Or, um, and I wanted it to be. I, I think. One of the questions that I have about, it, you know, lava is underneath everything. So it's, uh, I wanted it to be very eclectic research, right? so that it was looking at all kinds of different, you know, from pop culture to, uh, you know, literary. I wanted it to be pretty diverse in, in range. Uh, but then as things would come up, like the AF Yokel eruption, that uh, all of the, you know, the, Planes in Europe were grounded. Mm -hmm. So that came up while I was working on this project. So I was like, well, I have to put that in there, <laughs> or things like that. Um, and then as I, moved, as I worked on it, the later poems, um, I really did engage with the source text a lot in terms of uh, having arguments with them. And then when I started researching the Lockheed eruption, that became uh, a focus of the research. But at first, it was kind of random, I have to say. Any last question? I want to let you all stand up. You've been so patient with this uh, reading. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we're going to have books to share.